Hi there. Do you want to start your career in the tech industry but you are not sure how to start as a software developer? Are you confused to choose the most robust program language? Well, here is the Python tree. The only language used in every aspect of programming, whether you are talking about the web projects, the advanced fields like AI and automation, everything comes in handy with the Python tree. If you are still watching this, that means you are interested in becoming a Python developer. So, without wasting any more time, let's dive deep. Along with this journey, you will cover the topics from the basic Python data structures like list doubles to the advanced functions. We are gonna cover each and every aspect of the Python programming by practical hands on learning. Well, let me tell you this. The main motive is not to teach you code, but to make you write efficient code. So, grab your laptops and put on your headphones, cause the show is about to start. Python, we require a key element, that is a Python compiler. Honestly, there are many different compilers available on the web like the Python IDLE, PyCharm, Azure Notebooks, and so on. But we are gonna use the Jupyter Notebook, the convenient and elegant way to write code with the dropdown and markup. So let's just download the Jupyter Notebook. To download it, you need to open up your web browser, type Anaconda Python, and hit enter. As soon as you click enter, you will be redirected to the official website page of the Anaconda. Now you can see the website. Well, let's just go to the download options. We had two different options either for the 64 bit or for the 32 bit. You can install whatever you like. After installing, you need to double click on the installer and the installer will run. Click the next option, then we had an agreement page. Read the agreement and then you can click I agree. Then you need to install it for all users. You must specify it correctly. Hit next. Alright, it asks for the path. You need to enter the path. Then you need to check up the first option add Anaconda to the system path environment. That is very important. And then let it install. Why it is so that I prefer using Jupyter Notebook over the other IDEs? It's pretty simple. Jupyter Notebook is an open source web application that allows you to create shared documents that contains live code, the equations, visualizations, narrative text, all of things in a single pack. It has various use cases that include the data cleaning, transformation, numerical simulation, statistical modeling, data visualization machine learning, AI, and much more. For opening the Jupyter Notebook, you only have to go to the Start option and type in Anaconda. You will see the Anaconda Navigator. Press it and wait for a while. It's gonna take a while as the Anaconda package is a very heavy package with lots of IDEs. You will see in a bit. And voila, we are in the Anaconda Navigator. Now you can see the whole ranges of different IDEs, including the Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebook, Spider, VS Code, Orange 3, R Studio. The Anaconda supports both the languages, the R and the Python. So let's open up the Jupyter Notebook. Click on Launch. As soon as you click the Launch, it is redirected to your web browser, and you can see. The Jupyter Node. Click on New and open up a Python 3 Notebook. Voila, you are at a new Jupyter Notebook. Let's test it out. Friend, hello world. As soon as I press Enter, it shows me the code. Pretty simple, right? 
the another way of opening a Jupyter notebook is via a command prompt. Open the command prompt and type in Jupyter notebook. Press enter. And you are redirected to the same web browser with the same Jupyter notebook. We initialized a Python 3 notebook and now you are ready to go with the code. Easy, right? We are all set up. So let's discuss the first basic principle of the Python programming that is variables and data types. A Python variable is a reserved memory location to store the values. A variable in a Python gives data to the computer for processing. You can think of a Python variable as an empty container and it is assigned a value. Well, the assigned value is called a data type. There are three different data types that are used in the Python. The integer type data type, the float data type, and the string data type. The integer data type is used for storing whole numbers like 10, 11, 15, 20. Then we have the float data type. And then in order to store the names, we use string data type. Creating a variable is very easy. Now, let's just open up your Python terminal. For creating a variable, you need to write any name and then you are going to assign a value by using equal to sign. In this case, I am going to assign a to the value of 12. And it's a integer data type. Then I am about to assign a float value, a float data type. Then I am about to assign a name, which is a string data type. The important point you need to remember that in the Python programming, you don't specifically need not to provide the data type in front of the variable. You can directly assign it. Like when I put a equals 12, the compiler will automatically came to know that 12 is an integer data type and by default value of a is an integer value. So when I run it, it has been compiled. So let's just print out the values of a, b and c. Now we just assigned a, b, c with a three different set of values. Easy, right? Well, you can choose any name. Like I can create any variable with x or y or z equals 12, 13, and 40. And I can print them out. x, y, z. Right? Now, you can see that in a single operation, I assigned three values at once. This is the power of the Python. It provides you the complete flexibility to be more robust. You can specifically create any variable with any name, but what would happen if I create a variable that starts with a numerical number? It provides me with invalid syntax. Well, that means there are some set of rules for defining the variable. You always have to keep in mind that a variable name never ever starts with numerical value. Instead of numerical values, you can choose the alphabets and the combination of alphabets. Let's just play with the variables. I'm about to create a variable age, which has an age of 13 years. And then I am going to define another variable age, but this time all the alphabets are in uppercase with a value of 15. So what do you think? If I am about to print the age, what would be the age? Well, let's check it out. If I print age, you can see it's 13. 
but if I print age, it's 15. That means Python programming is a case sensitive language. You can see that it is interpreting this value as different value from this age value. All right, in addition to it, let's just discuss one basic functionality of a Jupyter Notebook. Well, I write whole length of code, but what if I wasn't able to identify what I was doing? So I am talking about providing a heading to all these cells. Well, you can go up, select the cell, you can click on code and you have to select the heading. This is a level two heading. So we have discussed the Python variables, right? You just have to write that and remember the shortcut key to execute the program. Press shift and enter simultaneously and what? You can see that it provides you with a heading. I hope you get a fair idea about the data types. In this video, we are going to cover the string data type. Along with the theory, we are going to discuss some of its feature and reliable functions for the strings. Let's start off by discussing what is a string. A string is a collection of different symbols that we put in together and these symbols are generally the alphabets, numericals or the special symbol. So in order to create a string, you need to put the collection of these symbols in the inverted commas. Well, I specifically use the word collection of symbols because we are the only one who can interpret these symbols as alphabets or numerical values or the special symbols. But it's not an easy task for the machine. So what machine does, it has an SKI table and it uses this table to fetch out the values for these different symbols. Let's start off by creating a string. Now, we initialized a variable a with value 12. Now, if I print the type of a, you can see it's going to be integer. Now, if I just put the inverted commas, and now if I compile it and now I check the type, it says string. So, we just converted our numerical value into the string. You can create the string by any means of combining the alphabets with the numerical values or the special symbols. So let's just create another string, something like this, and then you can add special symbol to it as well. And if you combine, compile it, and then if you check the type of B, it's a string. Now, you are familiar with creating a string. If you want to fetch any element of a string, then you need to use the index. The index starts from the zero. If you type in B of zero and press shift and enter, you can see that the index zero is going to contain the value one. And if I increase it to one, it says two. So you can fetch any element by using the index. Now, if you want to get the last element of the string, you can type in here minus one. So you can get the last index of the value and if you write in here minus two you get the second last so that means when you are moving from left to right the index starts from zero and then keeps on increasing while when you move from right to left it starts from minus one and it in, it decreases then minus one then minus two then minus three then minus four and so on we just learned how to fetch a single element but what if we want to access multiple elements at the same time. That is, I want to fetch the range of values from the string. That's when slicing comes into the play. All you need to do is to do the same thing, but here we are going to provide the two values separated by column. The first value is going to be the starting index and the last value is going to be our ending index. So if I just write in here, if I keep my first value empty and if I write some value there let's say five and if i press shift and enter you can see it shows me the first five elements that are in my string and you can do it for the last indexes as well now all you need to do is to provide a value in the first 
place, let's say 9, and then you can keep the last space empty if you want to go till end. If I just compile it, you can see it shows me from the ninth index to the very end. But what if I want the values that are in between some range? So you can define it. You need to define the first element and then you need to define the last element. And then if you press shift and enter, you can see we get a range of elements that are inside our string. Next thing we have here is another function called capitalize. So let's say I have a string, say hello, and I want to make my first letter capital. So what I need to do, I need to type in C dot capitalize. And if I press shift and enter, you can see the first value is capitalized. The next function that we have here is the upper function. What if I want to make my each character capitalized? So what I need to do, I need to type in C dot upper. And if I did that, you can see all of the alphabets are now capitalized. And you can do same with the lower function. So all you need to do is you need to type in C dot lower. And if you did that, we get the alphabets that are edit. The next function is the count function. So all you need to do is type in C dot count and then type in whatever you want to search for. So let's suppose I want to calculate the number of L's in my word hello. So in order to do that, I write in L. You get the count as two. Now you can see we can count the number of times L occurs in my string. Now we can do it with complete entire string. Now I defined an entire string and in the string I am going to search for the string. I am counting the number of string student in my string B. So as you can see if I did that now I get 3 as my result because there the student occurs 3 times in my string B. So that's how you did it with count. The next function that we have here is called the split function. Now if I want to split my entire string I need to use b.split. If I did that it's going to split the entire string into the number of strings. It's very useful when you want to extract out the words from the entire string. Now you can print the length of b by just using the length function. We just separated out our words from each other with the help of this space. I didn't pass any value to the split function. That's why by default, it's going to separate the string whenever it, it encounters any space. So you can split the entire string by any alphabet or any special character, whatever you want. So let's just again split the entire string B by full stop. So I need to pass in here full stop. So if I just compile it, you can see now we have three different strings out of a single string. It's because we just encountered two full stops, creating it into three strings. Let's just store these splitted three strings into a single variable. So let's just see equals b dot split. Now we had the complete splitted values into the C. So what if I want to reverse the process and I want to combine those three strings into a single string. So to do, do that, what I need to do, I need to type in here. So I want to combine them via space. So I need to type in here space dot join and then I need to pass in C. So if I just did that, so you can see now we again have our string back. But you can see that you cannot see the full stops here. Why? Because these full stops in the previous function act as a classifier where it tells the function that you need to separate out whenever you hit the full stop. And in the join function, we used the space as an operator that is going to join these strings. So that's why you can see two spaces between the students and two spaces between the good and a student. So if you want to join them by, by the full stop, so all you need to do is write a full stop. So if you just did that, you can see now we had our original string back. In the previous video, we learned how to initialize the values. But there is
is only one problem with it, that we are manually assigning the values to the variable. So here comes the next question. How to get input from the user? Let's put it this way. Since we want to take the input, I can provide you with the inbuilt method called input. Let's just open a Python notebook and we are going to do the same as previously. We are going to initialize the variable a with input, variable b with input, variable c with input. Let's shift out. You can provide values like for a I am providing 12, for b I am providing 12.2 and for c I am providing hello. It has been compiled. So let's just print out these values. Print A, B, and C. You can pretty much see the outputs. We did provide the variables with the input, but how to keep track of which variable is getting which value? Let's just try a different approach. We are going to provide a label to each input. So to provide a label, what you need to do is to specify a string inside the input method. Like here, I am defining A. Here, I am defining B. And here, I am defining C. Let's just run it. Now, you can see we had a variable A and then we had a box. We can enter the same value 12. For B, we can enter 12.2 and for C, we can type in hello. Well, now it's more simplified version of the input method. Python also provides you with a unique built-in function called type, which is used to identify the data type of the different variables. So let's just try it out. You need to write type A. When you press enter, you see str. str means string type of b string type of c well there is a twist to that the value of a should be integer the type of b should be float and the type of c should be string here's a point to be noted when you are using the input method then it's going to take everything you provided to the variable as a string so that means we need to explicitly convert the string to the integer or the float value to convert the data types of a and b there is a simple addition to the same function uh, input function that we used previous how we can do that you need to type in end and then you need to type in input then you can write the label then we have to provide it with float and we need to take the input we provide the label b and for c we can use str even if you don't use the str the by default value c is going to take is string so you don't need not to worry about it when you just enter it now we can enter the values a 12 b 12.2 C as hello. It has been compiled. So let's just check the type of A, B, and C. So we are going to print type of A, type of B, and type of C. And what you can see now, you can see that the default data type of A is integer type b float and type c as string it's time to put our knowledge into the practical work here is your task one we have learned how to initialize the variables and we also learned how to take input from the user now the task would be to take two numbers from the user and you need to swap those numbers let's say i have an variable a that has value 12 and b with the value 15 now you had to write a script a code so that 
A has a value of 15, whereas B has a value of 12. Just think about it for a bit. Have you thought of the solution of the task? Well, let me help you. The traditional approach would be using a third variable that can store a value of A for a time being when we copy the value of B into A. And then we can use that temporary variable to provide the value to the B. It would be very easy, right? Let's just implement it. So the first thing that you need to do is to take the input from the user. Since these are whole numbers, so you need to keep in mind the data type must be an integer. So we provide x equals int input. We provide a label for x. Then we provide y equals int input. And then we provide with a label y. And when I press shift and enter, we can pro provide the value of x as 12, y as 15. Now, here comes the main part. It's time to swap the values. We need to create a variable temp, which is equals x. Then we need to change the value of x to y. Now we need to put the value of x in y. But we, can, we cannot override it by a x because the x has been assigned the value of y. So that's why we created a variable temp. So we need to do is y equals temp. It has been compiled. Now let's print out the values x and y. And you can see here we have the values as 12 and 15. And now we have the values 15 and 12. It's very, very basic approach. Let's just raise our level. Python can directly help you swap the numbers if you could write it as x comma y equals y comma x. Let's just take the input for once again. x as 12, y as 15. Now, if I print out those values, these are 12 and 15. When I did that, now I am about to print x and y. Well, it has been changed. It's because Python provides you with such flexibility, right? All right, now moving to the next step. We can do all of this in a single line of code. We are going to compile it in just two lines. Let's just see that approach. We are going to provide x and y as int input with a variable x comma int input and the variable y right now you can do this x comma y equals y comma x and then we can print the value of x comma y but let's just print our print the values here as well print x comma y now if I run it you can provide the values of x as anything like 12, y as 15. Now you can see that before this operation, we has 12 and 15, and after this operation, we has 15 and 12. Pretty simple, right? So far, you have learned how to take the input from the user and how to initialize the variable. Have you noticed? That while creating the variables we can only store a single value in a variable that's a bit of a problem what if i want to store hundred of value that means i had to create hundred variables that is a space expensive task but i don't want that we talked much more about how the python can provide you with the flexibility here also the python provides you with the data structure called as a list. A list is a very famous data structure in the Python that is a mutable or changeable is an ordered sequence of elements. Each element or value that is inside of a list is called as an item. Lists are great to use when you want to work with many iterated values. Well, when you're working with a list, you don't have to worry about the data type. You can 
resulted all the data types including the uh, the integer the floats anything you want let's just start by creating a list and open up your python terminal well to create a list you need to keep in mind that you need to use the rectangular brackets whatever you write inside the rectangular brackets it's going to be inside a list now here i created an empty list with name l or what i can do i can create my own list with the own set of values right hello 12 15.3 welcome and when i run it it has been compiled so when i just print l you can see that it automatically fetches the information inside the list and shows it to you the main advantage of using a list is that it's a dynamic in nature we don't have to specify the size of a list the more and more and more data values that you write inside the list the less of the size of the list is going to increase that's an advantage of using a list when i just print the list l it shows me the whole length of the information but i don't want that i just want to print out the 12 so to fetch a particular value inside a list we uses the index the index is the position that is relevant to the value that is inside the list the index always starts from the zero that means if i want to fetch the hello then i had to use the index zero for 12 i have index 1 for 15.3 i have index 2 and for welcome i have index 3 how can i print it Well, it's pretty simple. You can write print l and then the rectangular brackets, and then you specify the index. If I print zero and hit enter, you can see hello. If I print one, it sees the twelve. If I press the two, you see. If I what would happen if I print four? It will give you an error list index out of range. It's because there is no such element as l four. Well, we can write it down as sixteen. And if I run it, I have to compile it first. And if I run it, then you can see it shows me sixteen. Pretty simple, right? Let's just work with some of the most effective methods that are already present in the list. We can start up by finding the length of a list. Well, as the name suggests, we are trying to find the length of a list. So Python provides you with an inbuilt function called as an length, and then you need to pass the list L. So you can see that we had five elements in it, and the length of the list is five. If you want to print the last element of the list, then this function could be very helpful. To print out the last element, you can write in the index as length of L, and you can subtract one from it. and if you do that you can see that it prints the last element but there is another shortcut to it if you want to print the last element of a list you just had to write minus 1 it will provide you with the last element you can think of it as if you are moving from left to right then the index starts from 0 to n and if you move from right to left then it starts from minus 1 that means if i want to print the second last element of the list i just have to go and write print l and minus 2 and if i did that you can see welcome if i go for minus 3 15.3 so you can work with the list in both the directions that's pretty funny now our next method is adding an element to the list now let's just create another empty list that is j We created an empty list, and I want to add an element to it. So, to add an element, we uses a function called append. So, you need to write j dot append, and whatever you want to write in. So, let's say first element. You hit enter, and it's already there. So, you can print it out. Print j. Oh, it works for the twice because I compiled it twice. So 
you can see we can add an element by using the append method if i again append it you will see if i append 12 in it and if i print j you can see 12 is appended so the append functions add the values to the last of the list the another function that we are going to take a look is the pop function now using the pop function to delete the last element of the list so what you need to do you need to write j dot pop and when you just compile it you can see now if i just print over the j you can see that the last element 12 is gone now the next function is the range function what does range do well in this way in the very beginning we have seen that when we just print out the l we can see the whole length of values what if i want to see only a particular of them let's say i want to choose a range of them so let's just create another list with one two three four five six seven eight nine with the nine values i just created a list and now i want to print out those that ranges from two to five so since our index starts from zero and i want to print out the range from one to five that means i had to start from index one up to index four so i need to write it here x then again square brackets i want to go from one to four and if i did that you can see two three and four so it goes from index one index two and index three index one two index two three index three four so you can select these ranges even you can provide a variation to it if you want to get the range that starts from the beginning till some point then to do that you need to go for print x you need to keep the first first value empty and then you need to specify up to which point you want to go if you uh, wrote 5 in it then it goes up to index 4 if i did that and hit enter you can see that it goes from index 0 to index 4 index 0 1 2 3 and index 4 if i want to go from some point till the end then you need to go make a variation like you need to specify the points where you want to begin like i want to begin from fifth index till end so up till end you need to keep it empty if i did that you can see it starts from the index fifth the index fifth that is when you six seven eight and nine right okay so the most advanced version of the range function is if you want to increase increase the increment factor like you can see that it is iterating by a single value 6 then 7 then 8 then 9 and we have values from 1 to 9 so you are printing the values keeping a square bracket you want to go from initial up till end let's go with like we want to start from 0 to 9 and here you need to provide the incremental factor by default it's 1 if you don't specify it it's going to be 1 now it was going to provide you 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But if you change it to 2, it's going to provide you 1, 2, 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9. It is skipping one of the value of the list. We had our list L. And I want to remove the 12. And instead of 12, I want to put up 15. So basically, I want to override the index value 1 with a new value of 15 so how can i do that now we can fetch a value by the index so index is going to help us how you need to specify list that is l then you need to specify its index value that you want to update so i want to update the index value 1 that is 12 so 1 equals 15 and if then i print out l you can see instead of 12 we have 15 Another variation in the insertion operation would be 
I want to insert an element in between 15 and 15.3. I want to insert a new element by keeping my list as it is. So I can do it by using an insert method. So all I need to do is to write L, that is my list, dot insert. Then you need to specify the index where you want to put your new element. So I want to put it on index 2, that is between 15 and 15.3. So 2 and the value that, has, that I am going to put in, in between is, let's say, mid. If I did that and print L, you can see we had a new value mid. And if I print out the length of L, you can see it has been increased to 6. Moving to the deletion part. What if I want to delete some elements from the list? So again, index is the only thing that can help you with that. So if I want to delete, that means I need to use the delete method. So I write delete, then the name of my list, and then I need to specify the index. So I want to delete the mid. The index of the mid is 2. So if I specify 2, and after that if I print L, you can see it's gone. Although delete operator is very powerful operator, you can not only delete the element, but you can delete the entire list from it. So if I write delete J, it has been compiled. And if I try to print J, it shows me error. J is not defined because the J has been completely deleted off. Let's say I have two lists, one with numerical part and another list with some names let's say we want to write a or b or any numbers so we had two lists l and j now i want to join these two lists so the one way of doing is by the addition of it what you can do is i can print l plus j if I did that, you can see it append the list into a single one. Now, the another way of doing this is using a method, which is an extend method. So all you need to do is to choose the list, which is going to be a super list that is going to append the element of other. So I want to consider L as my super list. So L dot extend, and then I pass in the another list that I want to add it. So I put in right J and then I print out L. Now you can see it has done the same operation that we did with the plus operator. Now the next function that we are going to take a look on is the sort function. Let's say I have a list as 2, 3, 1, 5, 2, 3, 1, and 5. And I want to sort it in ascending order. So I just need to do is print L dot sort. If I run that, if I run that, now you can see that we have sorted out our list. So all you need to do is to write the sort function. Now it's in ascending order. What if you want to make it in descending order? So you need to write a parameter here, reverse equals true. If you do that and enter and now it has been reversed. So far, we discuss about the lists. Let's explore the another data structure that is called a tuple. Now, a tuple is a collection which is ordered and unchangeable. In Python, tuple are written with the round brackets. Tuples are sequences just like the lists. The difference between tuple and a list are that the tuples cannot be changed unlike lists. We can create the list, we can insert element in the list, we can override the existing element in the list, but 
all these operations are prohibited in the tuples. Let's just start by defining the tuple. Opening our Python notebook. Now, if you remember correctly, then in the previous video, we created the list, an empty list, by assigning a value to square brackets. But when you want to create a tuple, you need to use the round brackets. When you use the round brackets, you are creating an empty tuple. If I try to print the type of the A, it shows me class tuple. As I already mentioned, that we cannot add or delete any anything once a tuple is created. So if I try to insert anything in a tuple A, then let's see what will happen. I write a of 0 equals hello. If I try to compile it, we get tuple object does not support item assignment. It's because we cannot do such operations. Now let's just create another tuple with some predefined values. We are about to create a tuple a equals and we are going to use again the round brackets and then we can define whatever data we want to use. There are no restrictions on the data types that you can use in the tuple. I can use the string, the integer, and the float. It has been compiled. Now, if I print A, then you can see it shows me whole range of values. Now, its operations are as similar as of the lists. It's time to discuss the some predefined function for the tuples. So, the first thing that we have for accessing an element in a tuple is definitely an index. Same rules applies here. The index starts from the zero. You can access the element just by writing its index. But you cannot override any existing value. If I try to override 12 with 13, then it gives me an error. It does not support item assignment. It's because it's immutable in nature. Now, the next thing is the negative indexing. What if we want to fetch the last index value of the tuple? So, we need to write minus 1. And it gives me the last value. Next thing we have is range. For range, you can use different, different combinations. Like if I want to print from the very beginning up till some point then I had to keep my first value as empty and then I need to define the number up to which I want to access the value let's say 5 not 3 if I do that it shows me first 3 if I did that it shows me from the index 3 up till the end and I can slice it, it in between 2 and 4. So now you can see all the variations that we can use in the range function. Same applies for the length function as well. To find the length, you just need to use the length function and then pass in your tuple. Then you can see the length. Talking about the delete function. Now, as you have already seen that you cannot insert or update the current values that are already inside the tuple but you can delete the entire tuple i can delete the entire tuple and if i try to print a it shows a is not defined so you cannot override the existing values but you can delete the entire tuple let's discuss our third data structure that is a set a set is a collection which is unordered and unindexed this data structure is used when you don't want any data redundancy in your system. If you want to prevent your system to get the duplicate values, then you are more likely to use the sets. To create a set, you need to use the curly braces. So you need to assign a variable and then use the curly braces and then you need to write up your data.
Now I am going to show you how it is going to remove the data redundancy. I am going to write hello again and then I'm going to compile it. Now if I print A then you can see it only shows 4. It's because the hello has been repeated twice. But if I changed the H to the uppercase and then I run it, then it shows me 5A. So in this way, the set has the capability to remove the data redundancy. Let's discuss some useful inbuilt functions of the set. The first function that we had is the length function. So to find the length, you can use LAN and then pass in your set. You can see the length. The next thing that we had is adding a set to the another set. So it's pretty much like the mathematical union. So in order to do that, you need to create two sets. So I am going to create two sets and I am going to assign them a value. And then I have to choose which set I want to create as a superset. If I now in this case I am going to assign A as my superset. So A dot union and then I pass in B. If I if I hit enter, now you can see that these two sets are combined. But still, as you can see that we have 16 here and 16 here, but we only see 16 ones. So it's because it has the tendency to remove the duplicate elements. The next thing that we had is the intersection. What if I want to fetch out the elements that are present in both the sets? So to do that, we need to use the intersection operator. So what we need to do is just a dot intersection and then we provide the set b. If I did that and you can see the intersection, it's the only the 16 value that, uh, that is occurring in both the sets. So you can get the intersection of these two. Now to remove an element from a set, you can use the pop operator. So I am going to use a dot pop. If I did that, so, and now if I print a, now you can see one of the hello has been removed because in a we have two hellos. So last of the element is removed. So far we discussed the three different data structures that are widely used in the Python, the list, the tuple, and the sets. If you want to store a huge number of data values and you want to simultaneously process them, then you specifically need to use the list. But if you have already processed the data and you don't want the data to be changed, like declaring your result or declaring your grades, then you must use tuple because they cannot be overrided. And then come the set. We use the set when we want only the known duplicate elements to reside inside the data. Then only we use the set. So far, we have discussed the three different data structures that are used in the Python. Now, we are going to discuss one of the most important data structure, that is a dictionary. Well. A dictionary is used to store a key value pair that are separated by the caller. The items are separated by commas and the whole thing is enclosed in the curly braces. An empty dictionary without any item is written with just two curly braces. You need to keep in mind that keys are unique within a dictionary while values may or may not be. The values of a dictionary can be of any type. But the keys must be of immutable data types such as string, numbers, or tuples. Let's begin by creating an empty dictionary. To create an empty dictionary, you need to assign a variable to the curly braces. If you compile it and check the type of that variable, it's a dictionary data type. In order to add the element into the dictionary, you need to provide a key and a value pair. So instead of writing the indexes, we are going to provide it with a key and a value. We write an A and then we use the square brackets 
and then we provide the key so the key could be monday and i provide its value equals one if i compile it and i print a you can see monday which is separated by colon with the value one now if i want to add another key value pair i use a tuesday equals two now if i print a you can see two key value pair you can check the length of the dictionary by using length function it shows me it has a length of two if you want to delete all the elements in the dictionary then you can use the clear function a dot clear if you did that and if you print a you can see an empty dictionary now to create the dictionary with the predefined values what you need to do is a equals curly braces then you write in the key then colon and then the value now this is a single key value pair we write in another key value pair and then the another key value pair and then the another key value pair. now we have a dictionary with the four key value pairs so in order to fetch only the keys of the dictionary you can use use dot keys method so you need to write in down a dot keys so you can see the keys and similar goes for the values if you write in here values you get all the values that you used in the dictionary let's discuss dictionaries in more depth you can not only assign the values as one two or three but you can rather create a list of values like in place of monday the value could be a list and on the value of two i create i can create a tuple with a value of one two three four five in the place of three i can create a set with a value of one two three four and five and if i did that and now i use keys and now i use values so you can see that we can store that list the tuple or the set in a dictionary now the more complex form would be storing the dictionary as a value inside the dictionary so instead of writing here the value i am going to assign another list to it another dictionary to it so let's just create another dictionary and add it there so i am going to scroll up insert a new cell and i am going to create a new dictionary i'm going to create b a new dictionary and i am going to write uh, a and b as its value key value pairs now i pass in here as b i get it has been compiled if i use the dictionary if i use the keys and now you can see the values so here you can see that it has been changed to the, to the dictionary now it is called nested dictionary it is the more complex form of using a dictionary you'll get to use to it it's time to discuss the loops so far whatever operation we have done we have done it for the single time what if i want to execute the same statement for 100 number of times that means i had to write 100 times the code that's not feasible right so that's why we had loops the first kind of loop that we are going to discuss is a for loop the syntax for writing a for loop is that you need to write for then 
you need to create any dummy variable let's say i in range and then you pass in the length up to which you want to execute that statement if i want to execute it for 10 times then i write in here 0 comma 10 now i write here column when i press enter you can see the alignment of the text has been changed it is called the identation it's the method that the python used to keep track of the loops statement it helps python to keep track of the structure so now here you need to write in whatever statement you want to execute so let's say i want to print out how many times this loop is going to go so i write here print the loop iteration is i when i press enter you can see the loop iteration is 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 up to 9 so it goes up from 0 to 9 that is 10 times now you can start from any number if i want to start my iterations from the 5th to 10th then i specify here 5 instead of 0 if i press shift enter then you can see it goes from 5 up to 9 let's understand the for loop by using an example this time we are going to create a list we are going to take the input from the user and then we are going to append that value inside the list in a dynamic fashion and we are going to use for loop for that so first we need to create an empty list then i am going to define for loop for i in range and let's say i want to go it for five runs so i write here five and and now I, I am going to write whatever I want to execute for the five times. So for the five time, I am going to take an input and I am going to append it to the list. So that means I am going to append. What I am going to append? It's the input. So I am going to take an input from the user and I am going to append it. I can write a label and a value. So when I press shift and enter so it goes for enter value i write in here 12 then 13 then 14 then 15 and then 16 now the loop has been terminated now if i print l you can see we had all those values inside the list let's discuss the another loop that is a while loop now while always checks for the condition if the condition is met then it goes for the iteration if the condition is false then the loop is terminated the syntax for writing the while loop is you need to write while and then you provide it with a condition that condition could be anything so let's just create a condition so i want let's let's suppose i want to execute a loop for the five time so i did i equals five and then i write in while i is greater than zero then i am going to go for print the iteration i now when i press shift enter you can see that it is going infinite number of times well why because we are not changing the value of 5 that it's always going to be 5 because there is no operation that is going to perform on the i so what you need to do we need to change the value of i so i want to go it for 5 times then i need to write here i equals i minus 1 now if i then press shift and enter you can see it is going to execute for the 5 times it's because when it goes for the first iteration the i is going to be 5 then it's going to check is 5 greater than 0 yes 
now when it comes here the i value has been updated to 4 then it's checked again 4 is greater than 0 yes now i has been changed to 3 it's true so it's again goes into the loop then for 2 then for 1 and when it's going to be for the 1 then when it comes here it it is going to be 0 then it's checked for the condition while 0 is greater than 0 no it's false so the loop has been terminated So far, we have learned how to execute same code for the multiple times. It's time to learn new concept, that is a conditional statement. As the name suggests, if a condition is met, the program for law will change. If the condition is not met, then it goes the other way around. We can create the condition statement by using if and else statement. Along with the conditional statement, we are going to see some of the Python operators that we are going to use in the Python 3. Let's just create a condition statement that is going to check whether a number is even or odd. So I'm going to write in a number and I am going to take it as an input from the user. Since it's going to be a number, so I need to keep in mind that its data type must be integer. So I provide a label and then I am going to write my conditional statements. So in order to write the conditional statement, I have to write if. Then to check if a number is even or odd, the simple logic would be that you need to take the modulus of the, of the number with 2. If it's 0, that means a number is even number. Or in the other words, if you can completely divide a number by 2, that means it's even. If you can divide it, it by 2, that means it's odd. So, we are going to do the same. If a modulus to double is equal 0, then you need to keep in mind the identification. Then, we need to print it's even. Then, else we are going to print it's odd. Now, if I run it, it asks for the input. If I write in here 20 and press enter, it says even. Now, com compiling it for one more time, if I write in here 11 and then I press enter, it says odd. Now, it's, it is all about writing a single condition. What if I want to know that if if I had multiple conditions to check for, like I want my number to be even and I want my number to be greater than 10, right? So if I compile it, now I need to provide the 12. If I press enter, it says even. Now, if I compile it for one more time, but this time I'm going to provide an even number that is less than 10. Now, if I press enter, it says odd. Why does it say odd? Because this condition is not met. So that's why its default flow is changed in this direction. But it's not correct. Now, we want to write another statement that in order to write a, another statement, a, another condition statement between if and else, we need to write elif. So elif a modulus 2 double is equal 0 and a is less than 10 then I am going to print even but less than 10 so if I compile it now if I provide it with 12 it says even I'm going to compile it one more time this time I'm going to write 8 if I press enter it says even but less than 10 right so now you can write n number of conditions using the if, elif, and else. And you can write n number of operations. So when you write in here and, that means both the condition must be met. Now there is another way of doing this. You can write here or. If I write in here or, that means either this condition be true or this condition be true. If any of this condition is true, 
then it's going to execute this cell. We have learned so many concepts and we almost went through most of the course. Till now, we are using the ad hoc approach. That is, as soon as we get the problem, we start writing the code without any format or structure. Now, in introduction, I talk about that. I would teach you not to write the code, but writing the code in an efficient manner. That's when function comes, comes into the play. Till now, we are using the inbuilt function, but now it's time to create our own function. Let's just jump to our Jupyter Notebook. Function is a block of code which only runs when it is called. You can pass the data known as parameters into a function. And after some computation, a function returns data as a result. In Python, a function is defined using the def keyword. Let's just create our own function. You need to define, write it def, then you need to write the function name. So I am going to write my function. And then you need to write the parenthesis. If you remember correctly, that whenever we try to use any inbuilt function, we always write the parenthesis after that. It's because it's the signature of a function. Whenever you see these parentheses after any variable, just get into your mind that it's a function. And then you write in the column. When you press enter, you will see that the identification came in. We just defined our function and now you can write whatever script you want to execute. So let's first execute a print statement inside function. All right, so now my function is complete. So how do I call this function? Now, in order to call this function, you just had to write its name. So I'm going to write my function. And then you need to put the parentheses. When you press shift enter, the code has been executed. We just use a print statement inside a function, but it's not much of a use. We use the function when we want some additional computation. So let's suppose I want to create a function that can calculate sum of two numbers. So let's just create a variable that is going to calculate the sum of 15 and 20. I can print a as well. So if I just compile it and if I run it, you can see it says 35. Now the another way of doing this is using a return statement. Now when we use the return statement, it is going to return a value back to the function where it's, it has been called. So let's just write here return A. Now if I just run it and if I again run it, you can see it says 35. That's, it's the more elegant way to transfer information from one block of code to another. Let's just increase the complexity of a function. Now, what I am going to do, I am going to write a function inside a function. It's called a nested function. So let's just create another function. First, let me create a print statement that says it's function one. And after that, I am going to define a new function called my function two. So in order to define a function, you need to write def keyword. Then you need to write the function name, function two. Then you need to write parentheses and then you need to write colon. As soon as you write colon and press enter, you see the identification came in. Then I am going to calculate again the sum of two numbers. This time, let's just take input from the user. Int input. And then we provide here label A. We take another variable B, int input. We provide in here variable B. And then we are about to print the sum of a and b right so let's just compile it it has been compiled now when i execute it you will only see function one there is a problem with the code why my function two is not working it's because 
my I have never called my function do in order to use a function you need to call it so I went back to my function one and then I write in here my function two function two now if I just compile it and if I now run it now you can see function one and then it asks for value for a that means our second function has been executed so provide in value of a and then of b and then you can see the result this is how you work with the function next time rather than creating a hundred line of codes in a single go try to use the functions in this way you can keep track of all the functionalities that you have implemented in your code and then maybe you can also reuse that code for computing some other tasks that's why functions are very 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 necessary in our last video we learned how to create simple and nested functions but have you noticed a change when we use the inbuilt function we always tends to pass a value to it but when we create our own functions we never pass a value to it in this video we are going to learn the arguments that we can pass to the function. These arguments that we often pass to the function are called the parameters. Now let's just create another function by def keyword. Def function parentheses then colon then goes for orientation and then this function is going to calculate the sum of two numbers. But this time we are going to pass the value of a and b at the time when we are about to call the function. That means we need to use two variables because we are about to calculate the sum. So that means a and b. And we are going to return their sum as a plus b. So I am going to call the function, but this time I am going to pass a value. So I am passing 12 and 15. Now if I just run it, it has not been compiled. First we need to compile it. And if I run it, now you can see that it calculates the sum. You can pass in n number of values to the function, but you need to remember that then you need to update the function body with that value as well. So I can pass in here the string as well. Let's say student. Now I passed three variables, but in my function there are only two variables, so I need to define another variable. Now you can think of it as the 12 is mapped to A, the 15 is mapped to B, and the student is mapped to C. So, now, I can write here print C. So, if I just compile it and if I execute it, you can see it says student and then it returns the sum of two numbers. Now, let's suppose I don't want to pass three values. I only want to pass two values, but I want to use three values in my function. So that time you need to delete that value because we want to pass only two values. If I just compile it, it's going to compile because the function has never been called. It is expecting three values. So if I just compile it with two values, it's going to give you an error. It says missing one required positional argument C. So in that case, what you can do, you can write here C equals student. Now if you just compile it and if you just run it, now you can see it provides me with the result. This is called default parameters because you provided C with the default value. Now if I don't want to use C as a student, I want to pass in another argument, you can do it that as well. So I want to pass in here, let's say hello. If I just run it, you can say instead of function now we have hello it's because it's going to prioritize the things for you if you provide the third argument then it's going to replace this with hello with the third argument that you provide but if you are not going to provide the third argument then it's going to take the default value let's create another function but that function is not going to take a value rather it is going to take a list as an input so let's just create another function def func list then you provide the identification and then I pass in a variable l that is going to 
be identifier for my list. Now I type in here a for loop for i in range length of l. I am going to print each value in the list. So l of i. Right? If I just compile it, it has been compiled. So let's just call our function. So I call it as fun list and then I pass in here the list. So I am going to write one, two, three, and four. Now, if I just run it, we see an error. Oh, it's because I write the function and it's wrong. So now, if I just compile it, I need to compile it first and then I need to run. So you can see now it has been compiled and now you can see we passed a list as an argument and we see how a function manipulates the entire list. Now you can do pretty much with the dictionary, with the tuple, anything you want. In this video, we are scaling up the level and we are moving to the advanced features of the Python. That is a lambda function. Now what is a lambda function and why to use it? These are the anonymous functions without any name. Consider a situation when you want to compute a single operation on a single value. I already told you that I encourage you to create the functions for the better readability of the code. But when it's about the computation on a single value, you don't probably want to create a function that you need to use the def keyword and then write the identification and then you write the return statement. It's going to be hectic. So then lambda functions came into play. It allows you to write the function in a single line. In order to create a lambda function, you need to write in the keyword lambda. And then you write the value on which you want to compute something. So let's say x. And then you write colon. And then you write the expression that you want to compute. So let's say I want to go for calcul uh, calculating the double of the x so x multiplied by 2 this is how you create a lambda function and i told you that when whenever we are going to create a function it is it has a return statement and return statements returns a value to a variable so you need to store the entire lambda function into a variable so we can create another variable as q equals lambda x colon x into 2 now if i just run it it has been compiled. Now, all you need to do is type in here Q and then you pass the value of X. So let's say I want to go for four. Now, if I just press shift and enter, you see eight. Let's compare the Lambda function with the normal function. This time I am going to create a function that is going to calculate a cube of a function. So let's just define a function with name cube that is going to take an argument as Y and then I am going to return y times y times y. So I just defined a function q y with this and I compiled it. Now I am going to create a lambda function for the same thing. So this time I am going to be store it into a new variable g equals then lambda and then I write in my expression. So let's say it's x and then semicolon and then I write the expression. So I want to calculate the cube of a number. So x into x into x. Now I just compiled it. Now I have compiled both of my functions. So now I am going to print these values by cube. Let's find the cube of 5. So if I write cube 5 and shift enter, I got the 125. But if I type in here g and 5, then I also got the 125. Now the only difference that you can see is on the length of the code. Now, I used two lines of code, but I did same thing in a single line of code. So that's how you can better write down the codes. It's the efficient way of writing a code. When you want to make a single computation or when you want to compute a single expression, then you can directly use the lambda function. Let's just solve another example with the lambda function. But this time, this is going to be a little trickier. Now, what I'm going to do I am going to calculate the sum of first n natural numbers. Before starting this, I want you 
to take some time and think how you can do that. All right, in order to do that, you need to remember two functions. And you are familiar with both two functions. So the first function is the range function. Now, let's suppose, let's better understand the range function. Now, if I, if I write here range, and then I pass in some number like five, and if I press shift enter, you can see we had a range from zero to five. That means it's going to be like zero, one, two, three, and four. So this is how a range function works. It create a range from initial value to the last value. It's going to create a list of the values. And when we have the list and you want to calculate the sum of a list, then we had a function called sum. So using these two functions, we can create a major function that is going to calculate the sum of first and natural number. So let's just give it a try. Now, as I mentioned, now I am going to use range function because I want to first create the list of all the n natural numbers. So I am going to pass here x because my x is the value that is going to used for the computation. And when once I created the list, then I need to find the sum of the complete list. So in order to do that, I'm going to use sum function. Now, if I just did that, and then we need to compile it. Now, it has been compiled. Let's just call our function g with value 5. Now, if I just enter it, you can see 10. It's 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, which equals 10. It's been very, very easier to do such heavy tasks using such functions. You have almost completed the course. You learned every basic concept from the basic structure data structures like int float string to advanced data structures like list tuples, sets, and dictionaries. You learned how to use inbuilt function and you also learned how to create them by your own. In this video, we are going to solve another five problems with an intermediate level. I can assure you these problems will let you better understand to combine various functions to create something new. Let's just start by defining our first task. The first ta task is going to, you need to find the sum of odd and even natural numbers in a given range. Let's just suppose that we want to find the sum of odd and even natural numbers up to 20. So let's say we have n equals 20. And in order to find the sum of odd and even natural numbers, we need to remember the previous concepts. We discussed two functions called range and sum, and we also used it. So now we are going to use it to find the sum of odd and even natural numbers. So in order to do that, we need, first need to create a range up to that number. So that is going to be from 0 to 20. Now, when I'm defining my upper range as 0, that means I am going to start it from the even numbers. And then I need to find the sum of these. But there is only one problem with that. If I execute it, it's going to give me the sum of complete and natural numbers. It's going to include 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 20. But I don't want that. I want to find the sum of even natural numbers. So that means I had to write here increment factor. So by default, the increment factor is going to be 1. That's why every time when we use the range, its value is increased by 1. Now I want to increase the value by 2. So what I need to do, I simply need to put in here 2. Now if I just press Shift and Enter, and if I print A, now I had the sum of natural numbers that are even from 0 to 20. And you can do a bit of a manipulation in order to find the odd sum. So in order to do that, you need to just start your range from 1. And then it's going to skip the second value. Now, the range, going, the range that we are going to see in this function is going to be 1, then 3, then 5, then 7, then 9. So if I just print it out, and you can see we have AS100. 
let's discuss our second task task 2 the second task is to sort a string from the words in it so let's suppose i have a string this is a python tutorial so you can see we have five words in it and i want to sort the string a by each word so that means i want my output to be like a equals a is python this tutorial now you can see that each word is sorted out so i want my output to be like this so how i can do that now the first thing that should hit your mind is that first you need to separate out each word from the string so in order to do that we had a function called split so let's just begin with that so i am going to store the splitted values into a list l so l equals a dot split and i am going to split it by the space so if i just press shift and enter and if i just print l now you can see that we have our splitted words now all i need to do is to sort them so in order to sort them i am going to use a function called sort now if i just did that and if i print l you can see that our words are sorted out but i don't want list to be my output i want string as my output so that's why i am going to use a join function so i am going to join them by a space and then i am going to write here dot join and i pass in my list l and if i press shift enter we have our sorted string now you can do it if you want to sort the string in the reverse order so in order to do that all you need to do is to type in a parameter reverse equals true now let's just compile it now first we need to split it again then you can see this is how it's been split out then i use l dot sort if i print l it's in the reverse order and if i join it it's in the reverse order so in this way you can sort the string let's discuss our task three now our our task is three is to check whether a string is palindrome or row so palindrome is a special kind of string when you read it from the left to right or from the right to left the words remain the same for example if i look at the word race car if you read it from the left to right and from the right to left you will see that in both the direction it's going to be a race car now if i start it from the right side it's a r a c e c a r that's going to be a race car and if i read it from left to right then it's also again going to be race car so how to check such sentences so in order to do that we need to use a conditional statement the basic concept should be that you need to take a list and then you need to check it if it is equals to if i reverse the string and both of these matches that means it's a palindrome so that means my task is to reverse a string so i am going to use a conditional statement if a double equals a now i need to check it against the reverse value of the string so in order to do that i am going to use a slicing operator now the first value that we provide in this is the starting index and then i provide in the second position we are going to provide the last index and here comes the third argument that provide the incremental factor that how you gonna check out your list now if i type here minus one so that means it tells my string that it's going to be read from the last end now, we have seen that whenever you want to check the last element of a list or last element of a string we write minus one so when this minus one is used along with the slicing operator so it's going to check the the reverse of the string and then we are going to equate it to the normal string if both of these matches then it says print palindrome right 
So let's just check it out. If I just did that, we got the error. Oh, it's because I need to define my string in the inverted commas. Now, if I just press shift and enter, it's a value. Now, what if I just change my first letter R to capital R? Now, if I just run it, it shows nothing because the if condition is not met. And if I press in here else, and if I print it out not, and let's just run it out. It says not. Why is that that it says it's not a palindrome? It's because we have changed the string. Now, Python is a case sensitive language, so it's differentiating between the small r and the capital R. So that means whenever you are writing to check for the palindrome, the first thing that, sh that should hit your mind is to either convert your string into the uppercase or the lowercase. So what I am going to do, I'm going to go for a equals a dot lower. Now if I just press shift enter, now it says palindrome. It's because I converted all of my string to the lowercase. Let's discuss our task four. So our task four is to print out a pattern, a simple pattern, a star pattern like this. We need to print out such pattern. So how we can do that? Now, you can use the for loops. Now we need to use two for loops because just from seeing it, you can interpret that it has four rows and four columns. So for when the loops goes in for the first time, it's going to print a single star. When it goes for the second iteration, it's going to print two stars and then it print three stars and then it print four stars. So how we can do that? Now, let's just start, start it by defining the length of the pattern. So I'm going to go ahead with five length. So let's say a equals five and then I'm going to use for loop for i in range a, then I am going to use the another loop that is going to print out the patterns for the number of times. Let me just create my another for loop for j in range i. I created another for loop inside the main for loop. It's because this first loop is going to iterate over the number of lines that we had in our patterns. And the next for loop is going to be used for printing out the number of stars in a single line. So what I just did is like now it's going to be start from the one. So it I has one and then it is going to go for the first line. So then my another for loop came in and it goes up till the ith value. So J is going to print a single star. here. Now we have our first line and J is going to print only a one star. Now for the next iteration, i is going to be 2 and then j is going to print 2 times star. But if I just run it and then after my for loop, uh, I need to write my escape sequence because once it's stopped printing out the stars for inside the main for loop, then we need to write in, write in the escape sequence. Now if I just run it, you can see it's printing it in a single line. Well, for the first iteration, we got a single star and then we had our escape sequence. Then we had two stars in conjugation. Then we have our escape sequence. So it's not right. Now I want my these two stars to be in a single line. I want my these three stars to be in a single line. So in order to do that, you need to define another parameter and equals space. So if I if you just do that, that means whatever is going to be executed inside the my j for loop, it's going to be printed in a single line. Now, if I just press shift and enter, now you can see it print out the pattern. So let's discuss our task five. Our task five is that, that we are going to create a dictionary 
from two lists. So let's just suppose we had our list as A, B, C, D, and E. And we have another list as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now you need to keep in mind that both the length of both the lists must be same because the dictionary is going to take a key and a value pair and you cannot generate a key and a value pair with two different length size uh, lists so you need to keep in mind and now what we are going to do we are going to create a dictionary so that means we need to first define an empty dictionary as d equals curly braces so it just created an empty dictionary now i want to use the elements of the l list as my keys and the elements of j as my values so that means i need to go over the entire list so that means we need to use a for loop so for i in range and i want to go up till the length of l or j you can write it in whatever you want because both of the list have same length and then what i'm going to do i am going to write here d and then here we, you need to write the key so i am going to fetch the value of key so that's going to be by l of i and it's going to be equals to j of i now if i just did that and now if i print d you can see we had a key value pairs with a b c d e as our keys and was 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 as our values. Now you can just print it out as d dot keys and d dot values. In this video, we are going to learn one line Python scripts. Now, this video is all about the advanced topics, and you can do a heavy computation task just in a single line of code if you want to get the first the last element and the in between elements of a list so it can be done by so first just create a list and then you can use three variables like i'm going to use first and then star x and then last which equals equals l and now if i just print these like if I print the first, I get the first element. If I print the last, I get the last element. If I just want to use the in-between elements, then I can print them out using my star x. So if I just did that, I get the central elements. The next, next task that we had is unzipping the file. Let's suppose we had a list that has some tuples in it. Let's create the four tuples. Like we have these tuples. And now I want to create two tuples out of these four tuples in which my first tuple had the element as one, two, three, and five. And my second tuple had the elements of two, three, four, and six. So in order to do that, I am going to use a zip function so all i need to do i'm declaring a variable unzip and then i'm going to use a lambda function with let's say z and then i am obtaining a list using a zip on the star of z so if i just did that and now if i print my unzip and pass in my element as z so you can see now we had unzipped our element and created two separate tuples from the same list. Now next thing we have here is the Fibonacci series. Now Fibonacci series is the addition of the last two elements. So it is going to be like the first element is going to be zero, another is going to be one. So third element, which is the addition of previous two is going to be one. Now the next element is going to be two. The next element is going to be three and the next element is going to be five and it goes on. Now, if I want to print the elements of such series, so I can again use a variable Fibonacci and I am going to use the lambda function again here. 
so lambda n and then I am going to write if my n is less than equals to 1 or else it's going for Fibonacci n minus 1 plus Fibonacci of n minus 2. Now if I just press shift and enter and now I can print any element like I want to print out my 10th element so I need to pass in here 10 and then you can get the value of the 10th place that's going to be in the Fibonacci series. The next thing we have here is calculating a factorial of a number. So a factorial of a number is the multiplication of all the terms from 1 to that number. Let's say if I am talking about a factorial of 5 then it's going to be 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. So in order to do that I am going to use a variable n equal 5 or it could be any variable so I am going to use factorial equals then I am going to use the reduce function and then I have my lambda and I am going to use two elements in it x and y and then I provide the expression as x times y comma and then I provide here range which is 1 comma n plus 1 and in order to use my reduce function I need to import it first so I'm going to use it from fun tools import reduce oh, fun tools now it has been compiled so if I just print out my factorial now let's print out my factorial you can see it says 120 now if I change it to 10 and then I execute it so the 10 factorial is going to be this much so this is how this factorial is going to work out now the another thing that we can do is checking a palindrome using a single line of code so let's say I have a word as Nitin. Now all I need to do create a variable and then I can use word.find and then I need to reverse the word and then adding one to it and then I need to return a boolean statement out of it. Now if I just did that and now if I just print P it says true and if I change that name to like our previous example the race car and if I print P it says true true so if I just did that and now if I print it it's a false so these are the one line Python scripts that you can use to efficiently compute out, compute out the task. In this bonus video, I am going to give you various cheat sheets about the different concepts that we have learned. These cheat sheets are gathered from the web and from the various different learning resources like the Python crash courses or the data camp. It's not possible for you to cram each and every function that we came across. But if you do practice, you get habitual of using those functions. Although we discussed around 50 of them, but Python has much more diversity than that. It has thousands of functions. And these cheat sheets might help you with that. These cheat sheets include the various different functions that are frequently and most often used to simplify the task. Let's just discuss some of the cheat sheets. Now here we have our Py Python Jupyter Notebook cheat sheet. Now, if you are not much more familiar with the Jupyter Notebook, you want to check it out. Now, it's been downloaded from the data camp. It can provide you with every knowledge that you want to know about the Python Ju Jupyter Notebook. Next, we had our cheat sheet for the dictionaries. It has various functions, it has various methods, how to define them, how to create them, everything in a single cheat sheet. It's been downloaded from the Python crash course. Next, we have our beginning cheat sheet for our, the conditional if-else and loops statement. So, 
you probably want to go and check these out and try to figure something on your own. You might discover something new. Then we have our cheat sheet for lists. We discussed some of the defined functions, but it consists of more functions than that. The next cheat sheet that we have is for the dictionaries. Now, you want to definitely try it out because dictionaries are very, very much important when you are dealing with the databases and all that stuff. Storing a huge amount of information is very much crucial in programming. Without storing a database or without creating a large amount of data, you cannot do anything. So that's why you must check it out. And in last, we have the basic Python cheat sheet. If you did forget some of the functions, then you only thing that you had to do is to check out these cheat sheets and it refreshes everything into your mind. Although when once you are done with the complete tutorial series, and if you forget something, then you don't probably have to go to the video and see that. You only need to open up your cheat sheet and then look for the functions and then you need to revise and memorize the things and practice and practice. The more you practice, the better perfection that you had. You can find a download link to all of these files. I'm providing you a link that has all these cheat sheets in them and you can download it and keep it somewhere where you can frequently read it.